Welcome, everybody, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm Derek McPherson, the Vice President of Equity Research at uh, Red Cloud Securities. Uh, and today's guest is Mawson Resources, uh, a Canadian listed Finnish and Australian gold explorer. We're on the verge of putting out a significant uh, resource update from their Finnish project and have just started exploring in the Victorian gold fields, one of the hottest exploration camps uh, in the world. Today, I have with me on the on the webinar, Mike Hudson, Chairman and CEO of Mawson, and I'd like to thank Mike for uh, getting up early and uh, joining us from Melbourne uh, today. The format of the webinar will be as follows. First, uh, Mike will provide an update and overview on Mawson, particularly focusing on the on the Australian their Australian projects and the work that they're doing there. Um, and then we'll take your questions live. So at any time, please submit your questions via the chat, uh, and we'll get to as many as we can uh, after Mike's finished his presentation. To start with, I'll handle the disclosures. Uh, before and then we'll get into it. Uh, for Moss and Resources, there may be some forward-looking statements made on this call. I would direct listeners to the cautionary note on page two of Moss and Resources corporate presentation, located on the company's website. For Red Cloud Securities Inc., I would highlight this webinar is for information purposes only, and should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. And we note that this call does not take into account the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. Please see our most recent uh, research note on, on Mawson for any applicable disclosures. So with the exciting part out of the way, I'll now turn it over to, uh, to Mike to give us the, uh, the update on Mawson and what investors have to look forward to from the Australian projects. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Derek. Uh, good uh, afternoon, everybody over there. Good morning to those of us in, a, in, a, in Australia. That's uh, it's an early start, so excuse my rustiness as I move in here. Uh, Mawson, as Derek said, is, uh, is based in both Finland and here in Australia. Today's talk will focus on Australia. Um, I'm not sure if I made up that uh, that headline, but I'll try and honour it as, as much as possible, keep it interesting and, and talk about the geological opportunity here in Australia and how it relates really to, to one of our three projects. So as Derek said, uh, I am a geologist and optimist and, and I'm no doubt prone to make forward looking statements. So Mawson in a nutshell is, is captured here on this slide. Uh, in Finland, we've just completed a 14 kilometer drill program. We've now got 50 kilometers into uh, drill meters into a, into a uh, resource. Uh, we had an initial resource, just over 400,000 ounces. That was a third of that drilling in December, 2018. Had a very successful year demonstrated by some of those results um, and the resource upgrade is imminent next month, uh, and that's on schedule. Uh, we're, we're running geophysics there now. We'll be drilling again uh, at the start of September uh, in, in summer permitted areas, a long strike from those resources, and then going back and drilling with uh, 20 kilometres, five rigs uh, from mid to late December through to April. So a lot of work happening there in Finland and, and a resource that we've, uh, we made from a discovery from first principles. But uh, what uh, is taking everyone's attention at the moment is no doubt uh, the Victorian gold fields here with uh, the opportunity around Fosterville um, being becoming evident. And, and I think I can work, work through that a little bit more detail today. We have three projects, one we've purchased outright, two joint ventures um, and a first right of refusal on the largest land holding 3,600 square kilometres in the Victorian gold fields. So we're pretty well positioned there. We've got a strategic position a 10% holding in one of the ASX companies that came along with that uh, with that acquisition that that company is Nagambi Resources. Um, we're starting work uh, it's been delayed by a few months with uh, with the pandemic that uh, that has all turned us on our head but but things are starting a geophysical crew is literally rocking up over the next days to week and uh, and then a drill rig is also coming within the next within the next weeks, two to three weeks. So so uh, we're we're starting to play um, very well here in Australia now. Uh, you can look through the details here. Uh, the key points are we're around about the ninety million market cap, eighteen million cash that uh, Red Cloud uh, helped support uh, raise only at the end of May. There, so very well positioned to execute on all those drill programs just of, that I've outlined in, in Finland and Australia. The other key point is now an institutional held stock right across the board uh, 
uh, well supported in that current raise and, and, and the most recent ones over the last year or two. So in Finland, here's that uh, that runway of ounces. Uh, the the resource that we put out here in 2018, at the end of 2018, we've uh, now tripled the drill metres into that. We've got 45 kilometres uh, approximately within that resource area. Uh, we're looking at a plus million ounce resource is our aim. Uh, let's see how we get there. We're going to be close one way or the other, but it's, cer it's certainly uh, a significant upgrade. So uh, that uh, that's the other key point is, of course, with more drilling uh, that is starting this December. This is a multi-million ounce discovery uh, in, in that we're crafting from first principles, and and this is going to to, to multi-million ounces with with more drilling. The uh, the next point is here. If we just look at the the detail of uh, the key area that we drilled, this is only a small part. We drilled about. 5% of our host horizon. So we've got that 95% of that host horizon that, that that hosts this gold still yet to test, but this is a four by three kilometer area. Uh, the scales up here, uh, up here you can see 500 meters. Uh, Polocus, South Polocus and, and Rhea down here in the south are the three main bodies at the moment. They subcrop from the surface uh, in this point here and then trend or plunge down to the northwest uh, we've drilled Raya, you know, down to 800 metres now. We've drilled these bodies down to about 500 metres. The existing resource base was here in the green colour that you can see. So uh, we've we've extended those resources, especially in Pol the Polocus areas, uh, significantly um, where the, that new resource upgrade will come in and, and added some high grades through uh, through Raya by, by some infill drilling. The other key point is these model DM plates here, uh, what correlate with the mineralization. And uh, if you can see through all my scribbles there, uh, they, they relate to, to the mineralization and show us basically how to drill and where to drill these bodies because there's pyrotite associated with the gold, which is an iron sulfide that's conductive. The other key point is here that uh, we've got uh, some other areas, the hut out here where we've started to intersect all grades around these conductors. Um, with all the right geology and and down here at Rumiyavi. So another two pre-resource pre areas. We'll get some tonnes and grade out of Rumiyavi to add to the resource this year also, um, and, and uh, we'll be doing more drilling in both these areas. The other key point is that uh, this is this area is ripe uh, for expansion. There's no EM uh, and uh, hence no expiration, 99% cover here, so we need that geophysics to to see beneath that thin veneer of uh, till, the, the five metres on average, or even a little less. So lots of potential. We're, we're, we're working out to the northeast out here at the moment uh, in this direction uh, with, with geophysics, and, and we'll be drilling there in the next few months as a three kilometre trend that in that direction. Um, as well as you know, out in this direction and further south and this way, it's it's um, it's it's early days, but we must focus on what we know, of course. So that's pretty much Finland in a nutshell. We can now move on to uh, trying to attempt to uh, outline how to find the world's next great underground gold mine, and really that this is uh, the one hundred and one for for explorers. Uh, you know, it's easier to look where where there's fertility. Um, it's harder to find new terrains. They do exist, but but why not look where there's already 80 million ounces mined? Uh, and that's Victoria, one of the super giant orogenic systems in the world. But there's some key points around that that I'll go through that make it relatively new and unexplored in many respects. Also, why not look at uh, around one of the highest grade, high grade highest grade, pro most profitable mines in the world today at Fosterville. Um, nobody cared about looking for another Fosterville until just very recently. So there's many opportunities. Uh, in exploration, we always look for untested search spaces. So uh, don't go back to, to legacy projects and, and try and do what others have done before. Find a new discovery at, at that surface or, or find, a, find a, a smart and clever way to explore an, an something that's had some information but um, but people haven't looked in in that search space. In our case, our search space is high grades, these uh, Fosterville Swan Zone lookalikes uh, that extend under some historic old fields that were more important, much more significant than Fosterville in the day. 
Uh, once you've done, defined that search space, you've got to go out and collect the data and uh, and ultimately drill and drill and, and don't be shy on drilling. So that's really the recipe. Um, back the technical teams um, uh, with their ideas. And, and fortunately, in this market where there's where there's capital now again, and, and a willingness for people to want to support exploration, that's, uh, that can happen with much greater ease. And, and uh, there will be a lot of discoveries that have come out of the last three or four months of the enthusiasm for the gold sector and, and, um, and, and no doubt more on the way it looks like it's heading. So we're down here in, uh, this is where I'm sitting right now, down here in the, the bottom of the world, Victoria. The, the red dots are the super super orogenic systems of the world um, there's some there's some other dots on there but just focus on those red dots so you can see we're one of the the few that really matter in the world uh, and uh, that that has come back around through a, an interesting history so here's the 80 million ounces that have been mined but as you can see the the amount of ounces that came out was just incredible in the 1850s through to the, about the 1870s. It was just, uh, this This rivaled any modern day uh, mining boom and, and production levels. It was it was incredible. So a majority of those ounces came out in, in that time frame. There was a little boom around pre-World War I. Uh, here, reef improvements were allowed, or technological improvements allowed people to go a little deep, deeper. And then just look at this uh, little uh, trend here, uh, the increase in, in gold ounces over, over the last three years only. That's attributable solely to, to Fosterville. There are other mines that have been and uh, have been producing um, during this period over the last 20 years here, but but it's really the, the opportunity of Fosterville and that, that light bulb that has come on uh, has, has, um, has really become evident only over the last uh, six months, I'd say, and it's, and it's Canada that really gets this even more so than Victoria, uh, than Australia in many ways. Uh, Victoria has been, you know, a, a relatively poor jurisdiction for mining for many years. Um, look at look at this. Uh, people went to WA uh, down through here in in the Western Australian exodus in in uh, in the early 1900s and never really returned. Uh, everywhere else, I think, has got just as difficult. Um, Victoria is a pretty reasonable jurisdiction and, and things are happening and mines are being permitted and and uh, and and that sort of reputation has um, been overwhelmed by the rest of the world just becoming as as challenging as as Victoria was I suppose um, a bit earlier on uh, the other key points are here and and this is really the key point the the opportunities in the early booms were underground high grade only in in the 80s uh, the the oxide uh, explorers came through. Fosterville was one of those which, which was mined as an oxide open pit, and then then they went underground. Um, but but the old timers look for high grades, and really the same thing here is now the the search space again is these high grade underground opportunities that has only been relatively recent. And then the other key point that um, I'll talk about in a bit more detail now is that these orogenic systems, orogenies, form these events, big mountain building events. Uh, and and there's two different orogenies that form the two different styles of gold here. So even though we lump it all as orogenic gold, there's the mesozonal style, which is what was traditionally the uh, the Bendigo and Ballarats of the world, and that produced probably you know 75 million of the 80 million ounces. Uh, these mesozonal systems are nuggety. Uh, nuggety gold and quartz. It was great metallurgy for the old timers who could just stamp the quartz, form big alluvial fields. There was tens of millions of ounces in alluvial fields, uh, and and was very much amenable for the day. They just went and mined with their nose, and if they hit something, that was great. And if they didn't, they persisted. Whereas these nuggety systems are not amenable for the day uh, because uh, it's very hard to put resources around, and 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 they've been unmitigated disasters in reopening those mines. Um, in since the 70s and 80s so really the the mesozonal style is a is a style that isn't a, a modern day style and and what, what's fosterville well fosterville is one of these epizonal systems and and uh that's a that's a very different style it's it's finer grain gold more amenable for modern day mining it was refractory fosterville was a refractory deposit for forever and so long and that's why people really only look for the oxide that liberated the gold uh, five gram underground refractory dirt wasn't the greatest of mines, and and it really needed the Canadian capital markets to recapitalise 
uh, Fosterville and make it the mine it is today by um, by putting money into exploration and development and, and, and seeing the opportunity. So this is the search space underground on these epizonal systems. They, they formed 60 million years later at a much shallower level in the in the crust and with at, at, during a different orogenic event. And, and there's a bit of overlap in where these two systems exist, but um, but there's a clear distinction also. So so uh, that's really uh, 80 million ounces over you know, 150, 170 years um, in, in, in that slide, one of the key slides. So the light bulb went on and, uh, and you know, it doesn't take too much to get people excited at uh, millions of ounces at, at ounce type levels. And, and we all know that. We all know the, the output has increased from Fosterville over the last few years. And that's what's led to the, this increase in the Victorian uh, uh, gold output being as high as it's been since uh, pre-World War I. Okay, so so that's that's nothing new, and and um, there's only so much I can rely on Fosterville. But it's important to understand the history um, of any any exploration project to understand the opportunity, and that's really uh, where we get to here. So so the geological opportunity is more Swan zones, uh, no doubt, and and you know if you it's hindsight is a wonderful thing, but uh, back even in 2014 when Crocodile Gold. Uh, owned uh, Fosterville. Go back and have a look at the technical report that this is taken from. But visible gold is increasing at depth, down plunge uh, within the ore bodies. Uh, visible nuggets have been observed in drill core um, and only infrequently seen higher up in the mining levels. So they were starting to, to understand the opportunity here. And now we are ripped forward six years and visible gold is found and is present over large areas with quartz and uh, intersected at multiple targets. So there's no shortage of it now, that's that's nothing new, but um, but the hint was there six years ago. So where are the next hints, I suppose, in, in finding more of these systems? You know, here's the Swan Zone now, here's the latest uh, reserve statement, uh, reserve and resource statement. So just that grade, uh, you know, 8.6 uh, grams is, is what gets people excited. Uh, I, I'm, I've relied here again on Kirkland, but uh, you can see the very high grades here um, that, that they've been achieve, achieving, but the very high grades are relatively thin, right? A metre or so, 1.2 metres in that respect. And, and then into the wall rock, we see grade and sometimes, you know, up to an ounce, but the, the super uber grades are quite restricted in, in these quartz quartz veins, which are, which are quartz and stibnite, which you can see in the white here. So that's very much what we call like Red Castle, which is one of our projects. So that I, I, I believe that the old timers are mining one of these Swan lookalike zones in the eighteen late eighteen fifties, and and nobody's cared to look again because the geological opportunity evident. So let's see if I can uh, convince you one way or the other. There is a new paradigm in the understanding of Victorian geology, and that has led also to this this uh, this opportunity. It's just not grey and, and uh, scale at Fosterville, but the the understanding of the geology is a lot different, of course, than the 1860s when there was uh, huge immigration into this part of the world and and all those ounces coming out. But but without going into too much detail, lots of very good work has gone in and and led to directly some discoveries, um, especially out in the Stavely zone. Um, that those that, that mineralization in many ways was predicted by by this work. So uh, all kudos to the Geological Survey of Victoria. So what what uh, that work has led uh, to to uh, this this busy slide. Um, here's here's the geology lesson um, for the day, I suppose. But uh, this is this is this is Victoria, the state of Victoria, um, Melbourne down here. In the three main tectonic zones, the Stall Zone, the Bendigo Zone and the Melbourne Zone. No doubt the Bendigo Zone has produced most of the ounces, but most of the ounces from those mesozonal styles. Uh, and the Stall, um, again, is that earlier event uh, manifested slightly differently in, in mafic rocks and sediments. And, and, uh, and, and then the Melbourne Zone has sort of been underlooked. You know, there's millions of ounces that have come out of the Melbourne Zone, but uh, a majority of it is undercover. Uh, thin cover, sort of 10 to 50, 60 metres of Murray Basin sediments. The And, and I'll, I'll show you uh, the 
distribution. But really, the key point is that the, these epizonal systems form uh, in the eastern Bendigo zone and 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 eastwards into the Melbourne zone. Of course, uh, Fosterville is up here um, on uh, on this map just here. So so why is that the case? The the reason is, um, and we've only relatively uh, new. This is new understanding. The seismic lines have traversed across those three tectonic zones. Here's an interpreted section of that seismic, and and here's Fosterville, here's Costafield, and and uh, and which is the Mandalay deposit, and and our Redcastle deposit in in position on those seismic lines. The epizonal systems only form above this Selwyn block, which is this green rock here. It's a, a near Proterozoic. Um, uh, volcanic and sediment um, block that that uh, really has only become evident through this seismic work. This is the source of those epizonal fluids. So it doesn't exist underneath the, the Bendigo zone for the most part. This is the boundary between the Bendigo zone here, this, this uh, major structure, the Mount William Fault. Um, so it's only just in the eastern side of the Bendigo zone. So very, very distinct um, geological reasons why these epizonal deposits form, and um, and you, you've got to be in proximity to this underpinning, uh, this underpinning Selwyn block. So uh, there's a lot more information on our website uh, in in the geological opportunity under the Australian section if you really want to read a lot more about why that's the case. Um, but it's really summarised here. There there are two very distinct subtypes of orogenic gold in Victoria, um, and it's explained by that deep crustal architecture. The majority of gold has been those mesozonal styles that I've talked about, but the opportunity is this epizonal style, uh, and and Fosterville has re rewritten that opportunity around those those that epizonal mineralisation. So so we know where to look more or less for these these deposits, but we don't have to be that clever. Really, timers have left these deposits uh, ripe for the picking, so they're not we're not looking for virgin discoveries necessarily. So here's a, uh, a, a slide on Victoria, all the, the, the holders, uh, key holders. Here's our three projects. Now, I'm only going to talk about one of these three projects today because uh, Derek told me not to, to, to go on too long. And the interesting part is the question. So I want to get to those questions. But here's, here's Costa Field down through here. That's a, that's a million ounce plus uh, system in terms of what the gold's come out. That's Mandalay's deposit, Fosterville, of course. We've got one outright project down here, an epizonal system called Sunday Creek. Here's Redcastle that I'll talk a little bit about, which is a joint venture with Nagambi. We can earn 70% uh, uh, by spending a million bucks over five years. And likewise, up here, we've got the, 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 the extensions of the Rue Field, which is uh, another epizonal system. The yellow dots here are important. These are the epizonal style deposits and, and maybe a bit hard to see over line, but basically they form from that red line east. And that's the limit of the Selwyn block now, now that we know. So you really want to be in this eastern Bendigo zone and um, and trending to the to the east. And, and you can see those green boxes where we are is, is, is the sweet spot without a doubt. So, the, excuse me, I should just point out one other thing. This uh, We've got the first right of refusal on this red block of ground here, uh, which is Nagambi's holding. So that's the 3,600 square kilometres, the largest contiguous land holding in the state. That's the Melbourne zone undercover. Um, and, and then we've got the green, uh, these green boxes are our existing projects. So... So if you look sort of here north, that's the Melbourne zone undercover. So Nagambi, you've got 8% of that ground staked. We've got the first right of refusal on it. And back in 2010, or a long time before Fosterville became the opportunity, the Victorian government was putting out these pretty good 20-volume uh, 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 pieces of work about uh, gold undercover opportunities. The Melbourne zone is, is one of those uh, reports, Report 17, and, and basically, they talk about and believe it for what it is. It's only uh, statistics, but uh, based on the, the prospectivity elsewhere in outcropping areas, they see somewhere between three to twenty million ounces left uh, to be discovered in in that undercover area. That's outside of our current projects in the Rofer area, but but that's the opportunity that exists here in Victoria, and um, and and we've got uh, the right of first refusal on that that large land package there. So, a lot of detail here. Um, really, uh, you can you can study this in 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 a lot more detail. But uh, 
here's here's some of the main players in in uh, in in uh, the area. Here's the right of first refusal area. Uh, Doctors Gully, Redcastle, which I'll talk about, and then Sunday Creek, 100% Mawson joint venture and joint venture. Uh, here's Fosterville South that have been done a great job of putting Victoria on the map. Uh, here's Fosterville itself. Uh, the other key point is that in the blue here, I'll just uh, clear this whiteboard again, this blue hatched area through here, uh, which is around Fosterville, are these tender blocks that uh, that went up for tender uh, at the end of January when it extended a little bit into into February and had huge interest. You can imagine the, the hottest ground in the world in many respects surrounding the mining leases of Fosterville. Uh, due to interest and um, and uh, and COVID, that decision has been delayed. I've been talking with the government and, and uh, you know, that's going to be later on this year or early into next year now they're, they're starting to talk about it, even though it was meant to be sort of halfway through this year. So so that 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 is unfortunately pushed out. But uh, but um, no doubt uh, there's a lot of interest writing on on that. Uh, here's here's Costa Field, um, and and you can see we're immediately along strike uh, with Redcastle. So uh, the other the other point is it's a paucity of uh, majors exploring here. Um, there's Newmont. You can see that uh, we have the old gold fields surrounding that uh, that uh, early stage ground that Newmont's got there. But uh, and outside of Kirkland, it's it's really. Um, the juniors that have the opportunity here pretty much full now there's a bit of white on that map but that's pretty much unstakeable either national parks or military areas and and uh or too close to melbourne so so it, it's pretty much tied up now there's uh you don't don't think you can come into victorian state uh, ground now so just, just zooming in onto that area here's uh a map of the his fosterville here and uh, you can see, you know, beautiful deposit. Here's uh, Costa Field, which is, which has been a pretty handy deposit, uh, over a million ounces. And 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 the long strike extensions are, the, are this ground that Mawson has got under joint venture with Nagambi, immediately along strike, uh, 25 kilometres east, north south structures which control this. As for Fosterville, they're the main structures that have tapped that Selwyn block and um, and produced these these epizonal fields. Uh, the the key point here is that uh, you can see dates on here. Discovered 1859, discovered in the 1860s, but mainly worked in the 1890s for Costerfield, and uh, and then Fosterville was discovered in 1894. The old timers went after grade, so you know it was really 30 years before these two other current mines, Costerfield and Fosterville, were really uh, discovered or worked on. Uh, Redcastle had been essentially uh, mined out in the old timers version, you know, down to 50 meters. So, so, uh, and here's the incredible thing: How do you find a high-grade underground gold mine? Go in the shadow of the the head frame um, and go and find a new search space. And 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 our simple premise and thesis is: Go underneath these high-grade mines. There's 17 kilometers of veins, if you uh, of vein trends of of the structural trends of uh, of Redcastle that uh, are combined that have been untested. There's not one drill hole in our ground beneath these historic mines. A lot of drill holes, 100 and 220 holes, uh, looking for the oxides on the margins of those those uh, those structures. Um, average hole depth, 38 metres, deepest hole, 80 metres, never a diamond hole. So it sometimes uh, staggers me also just the opportunities that exist. But this is one of our three projects. Uh, Sunday Creek will be drilling at uh, shortly also. That has some um, great results that uh, just uh, demand to be followed up, and 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 we'll be doing that. But this this was uh, used as an example here to really discuss the opportunity. So here's here's Redcastle in detail. Uh, you can see uh, the the trends here. Are, these are the main trends uh, that that form. If you if you add up all of those, um, you'll see that they add up to seventeen kilometres. And and then just look at some of uh, what occurred here um, from the 1859 to 1865 was the main uh, history here. You've got to understand the history and why it didn't uh, continue. And in, in 1895, 30 years after the main mining, um, I've seen some references that talk about it's it's a it's a, a incredible that this this mineral field has left been left idle for so long in 1895, and and that that still holds. 
Um, and uh, we've got a drill rig uh, literally turning up in, in weeks to be the first to drill under these systems. But uh, the key point is here, look at the grades. You know, there's nearly 30,000 ounces taken out of this trend here at over 100 grams per tonne. Uh, you know, the the areas here they would talk about, it's very hard to get e exact grades. Of course, we're talking 130, 40 years ago, but these were uber high grade, visible gold in quartz that uh, was mined for hundreds of grams. Um, and and uh, I think a, a really good measure is that basically I've seen uh, reports for a number of these mines that stop mining at 21 grams. The veins are, are thin here, um, about a metre uh, wide was what the old timers took. But remember when we showed that Fosterville uh, drill hole, that was the very high grades. And, and there's been gold found by some of that uh, drilling beside the the um, these veins to show that there's gold outside those high grade veins. And then there's multiple styles that just wouldn't have been of interest. So, you know, there's dike zones here. Look at this one, 11 and a half metres that went 25 to 120 grams. Um, just that sort of grade um, around the lower end just wasn't of interest um, to the old timers. There's uh, the stock work zones, they, they call the mulliky zones that were were uh, not really mined either. So broader, thicker zones. So really, who, who knows what we're going to find? The key target, of course, is what uh, to drill under some of these old shafts. The water table stopped them. Average 50 metres depth. The deepest the deepest shaft on the field is in this welcome group down on the left hand corner. So that's um, that's the that's the opportunity. And uh, I, I can see that uh, time's getting away from me. Last few slides here now. Um, so here's here's really what uh, what I've just said. Never a drill hole. 17 kilometres of uber high grades um, at that uh, that are just ripe for the picking. The other key point is that it's 50% cover, alluvial cover. Um, so the old timers only found that mineralization that was literally outcropping. So so here we are um, and, uh, and 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 uh, 170 years later and going to be the first to drill it. So in summary, you know, we're in two tier one jurisdictions. Finland has got a lot of drilling coming up a resource upgrade, and that's really only an interim step into a multi-million ounce system. Uh, we're fully permitted up there. Uh, and Victoria, um, the excitement is genuine. Um, and you can see, I think, from what uh, what I've presented here, just on one of the three projects that uh, that we've got a really good crack at uh, at finding something here that uh, that can look very much like another swan zone. The hints are all there, like it was in 2014 for Fosterville. Uh, and um, and we look forward to to just getting on the ground as we are and um, and um, starting to collect that data and drill drill drill. So thanks, Derek. I'll uh, leave it there. Sure, thanks, Mike. And and I think uh, everyone benefited from what is a, a very detailed history and overview of the geology in Victoria. And I think that's uh, that's important with so many uh, players there. Um, Maybe uh, uh, what might, you know, obviously you acquired these Victorian pro projects in uh, in uh, January this year, um, but you have an interesting link to these projects and sort of how, how did they come to be back in back in your hands and back in Mossa? Maybe I'd give us a little bit of uh, a little bit of color on that. Timing's everything, Derek, and and um, and I never get it always right. Perhaps I did this time, <laughs> but 17 years ago or 18 years ago, I... I uh, negotiated one mine out of Perseverance, which was uh, the company that was mining Fosterville at the time. Uh, they mined another oxide uh, zone called Nagambi uh, and um, and put together a, a, heat, a, a bunch of epizonal projects then that we vended into a company called Pan Aegis that ultimately became Nagambi. So, so uh, the seed of that was um, basically... Yeah, myself, my business partner, and and then Redcastle uh, was was added to that mix, and that came from a, a geologist called Rex Motten, who's uh, running and put together all the ground for South Fosterville. So so we're back. <laughs> the team is back. Um, slightly different companies now, but uh, we were just seventeen years too early. <laughs> um. So follow up question. I think this is in. Uh um with respect to australia um how are you exploring when there are overburdens or simply not doing anything are there geophysics structure geochemistry ahead of i guess i was talking about uh, what work you're doing ahead of drilling in, in in australia um to uh to get to to pick out those targets and what you're gonna what you're gonna be doing 
Yeah, so so like Finland, I suppose, where we have that uh, that nut cracked in many ways, the geology and the geophysical association that de-risks a project. That's uh, that's what we'd like to find here. So we're we're running three different types of geophysics starting next week. We're running gravity, which works well at Fosterville and Costa Field. These are basement highs, um, domes. So the main trend is well defined by that gravity. I'm not sure we'll get drill targets, but maybe we'll find some of the key areas over that 17 kilometres to drill at Redcastle. Ground magnetics we're also running, um, very low magnetic response in these rocks, these sediments uh, here in Victoria, but uh, but uh, we need to do that. It just hasn't been done. Literally, there hasn't been any geophysics other than a ground mag survey in the 80s that uh, was 400 metres wide and 40 metre spacing. And that's that's sort of akin to, you know, not even bothering these days. You would never even collect that. So we're going to much detail, much, much, much more detail, 50 metre spacing, continuous reading. So that will help map structurally. And remember, structure is the key here. And then, and then what we think will work um, based on, uh, what we've read and understanding these systems is uh, IP geophysics. So, so IP is looks at the chargeability um, and, and resistivity around these systems. Um, we've got to rely on having pyrite um, associated with those zones, and and they have been written up as such. So, so uh, we think we can find the more sulfitic parts that may relate to those wider, broader zones, those mulicky stockwork zones, or or those dike hosted areas. Um, more so than the high grade structures themselves and and then then ultimately you know it doesn't really need that today we want to go and collect that data because it's all about collecting the data and understanding the system nobody's looked back but there's more than enough drilling to go under these high grades you know the way, going under 30 30 thousand ounces at 100 grams at the old time has stopped left left grade underfoot and <laughs> with all this there's multiple uh, descriptions of uh, how they didn't stop because uh, the grade stopped. It was just the water that got them. So, so going underground, underneath those uh, those old um, those old mines is is a key also. And I guess looking at that, maybe taking that back a step further, um, how are you guys planning to prioritize your drill targets uh, with respect to um, uh, how are you guys planning to prioritize your drill targets when you get to get to that drilling phase? Yeah, well, it will be. Um, I, I, I sort of a, uh, did answer that uh, when your, your computer melted there, but uh, basically, we'll 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 rank on the historic areas and and how we read those those old mines and 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 combine that with the geophysical data that we're collecting and and the interpretation around that. Uh, uh, we're not only drilling here at Redcastle; we'll, we'll be drilling at Sunday Creek also, which is an intriguing system. It's uh, it's about a hundred metre wide zone. That definitely we'll see with uh, with the IP geophysics, and, and we're running that also. Um, I, I suppose one one other point to make is we're running gradient IP over the large area, which we'll see sort of the shallow sort of uh, thirty to fifty meters, and 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 define those sulfitic zones. But uh, but we're running uh, pole uh, dipole dipole uh, to see to depth, which we'll see to hundreds and hundreds of meters, and that will also help uh, before we we drill some of these targets. So th then there's then there's a whole lot of lithogeochemical work that we'll be doing and and looking at the the uh, variation towards some of these systems. But once again, that's a bit too clever before we've uh, we've actually drilled and collected some of this data because we just don't know. The, the intimate relationships around these systems and nobody does. So we, we've got to drill and, and understand. So ultimately, you know, um, commit the drill meters. We've got the budget to do it and and, uh, and early success will, will help <laughs> commit more meters, of course. And I, if I just uh, remind us, the plan, the initial plan is 5,000 meters, right, to, to test? It is. Yeah, it is. That's uh, that's the nominal number we're, we're, we're using, but uh, that will... Um, that will uh, is a is a moving target based on success and 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 the market, but that's what a sensibly technical number is as a first pass drill program for both Sunday Creek and and Redcastle. But uh, but um, I suspect yeah, early early success will see that uh, blowing out of the the water literally. Yeah, um, just as a reminder for those on the line, type your uh, type your questions into the chat if you have any, um, and then. Just maybe uh, taking a step a step back uh, and, and jumping across a couple of oceans um, over to Finland. Uh, 
maybe just what does uh, what's the the summer work plan um, at, uh, at summer? Sorry, what's the summer work plan in Finland? And then uh, you know, and when can uh, investors expect that uh, that resource update to come out? Yeah, the update is coming out next month uh, in August. Um, so, so yeah, let's pick a middle a middle of August date, but sometime around there, plus or minus a week, and uh, and we are running EM. Remember, that's that way, that's how we've cracked the nut with the association that we understand to date. I'm sure there'll be non-conductive uh, gold mineralization up in Finland, but it's worked so far, and so that's the obvious thing to run along the the trends that extend uh, beyond the mineral resource areas. Uh, so we're we're testing a three kilometer trend to the northeast, as I described. Uh, the geophysics geophysicists have been there. They've taken a few weeks break, and they're coming back again in another few days to continue that survey. So we'll we'll be looking at something like uh, you know I'm I'm guessing here, but between five and ten kilometers of strike extent beyond the resources, the immediate immediate strike extents at at various corners of uh, sort of around that resource area. Uh, to, to run that geophysics and and we have a rig plan to to come and test those targets that we're that will generate in combination with all the geology and other things we've done over the years so it's just not simply running one survey and generating targets but um, but that uh, rig will come in in September and um, and and ideally finding something in these summer permitted areas will will be a game changer for the project because uh, then we can start dr drilling out you know ideally resources all year round rather than be restricted to that that winter period from December to April um, you know because this is a this is a time uh, cost benefit exercise now as we expand this resource base right yeah um, and then you know obviously you have these sort of more advanced finish assets where you know where you're knocking on the door of a uh, in and around a million ounces, um, and but you look at the the earlier stage assets in Western or in Victoria, and you look at some of your peers around you that have some pretty significant uh, market caps on it. Um, I guess, what do you, I, what do you think um, investors should buy the stock for, and and how are you going to close the valuation gap against some of those uh, those high flying peers in in in, in your neighborhood? In Western in, in Victoria, yeah, you've always got to be careful what uh, you you how you you benchmark yourself, and one challenge begets another always in life. So you know when we uh, when we did our work last year, we were a twenty million market cap at the end of two thousand and nineteen, and we're close to a hundred million now. So so uh, you you may think the run's been there, but you've pointed out there's some pretty uh, spectacular discoveries that are being very well valued both in Finland and, and and Australia. So you basically get double the bang here. You get uh, in Mawson, you get you get the underpinning resource, which is which is real, which is tangible and and expanding. Um, and then you get the, uh, the 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 thrill of, uh, of of what Australia is is uh, is today, right? So so the irony is, and and you and I joked off camera, and we've talked about it. Is that uh, you know the dollars and time and energy and hair loss has come through uh, putting a resource together in Finland and and um, and the projects that uh, that we're back to only over a few months have created all the excitement. But but why not in a booming gold market that story was always going to work well and and um, and there's a whole lot of value tied up. Um, we did this financing and it should be should be said uh, at the end of May it was free trading and prospectus and of course there will be people who who sell. Uh, some who sell into that um, from from that raise, and I think uh, we've seen that sort of seven or eight week um, sort of churn of of paper, and we're yet to see the next step up. But why not uh, why not uh, deliver that through the drill rig um, as as is coming um, in but in both jurisdictions and resource upgrades. So there's there's a hell of a lot of catalysts ahead of us here, and um, you know I'm I'm genuinely very excited. Yeah, I guess post the post the last drill results from the winter program, which were or a couple of weeks ago, as I recall. Next next major news is uh, a resource update, and then the rig spinning and uh, rig spinning in Australia. So it'll get uh, it'll get busy again uh, after a little bit of a quiet period. Um, maybe uh, a bit of a, an operational question. It's something we've asked asking a lot of people. Um, how do you see? Uh, 
uh, how's the impact of COVID impacted sort of the progress you guys have been making in Finland and Australia and how's it, and, and for, for a lot of the people on the line won't know what the differences are and what the impact differences are from an operational perspective. Yeah, so not, not unfortunately, not a huge amount, right? Of course, we're, we've had to change the way we work like everybody does. But uh, in Finland, we're, we're pretty well placed. We're based in a, in a town called Rovaniemi, which is 50-odd kilometres from the project. All our staff are based in Rovaniemi. Um, we have big sheds where people can socially distance uh, themselves from, you know, logging core. You know, we've got literally, you know, we've got, a 50 meters of or 100, 100 plus 50 meters of core so people can certainly distance themselves and, and still continue that the, the assays have been coming back as we've seen uh, and and then drilling we've got drill drill companies and there's no no greater social distancer than a geologist in the field right uh, or a driller <laughs> in the field so uh, there's no exploration hasn't stopped in Finland in in Australia, it's it's likewise. Um, you know, we down here in Melbourne, you would have seen reported that uh, we're going through a, a second wave that uh, is still out of control. Really, you know, we're getting seeing hundreds and hundreds of cases a day. Uh, the Sunday Creek area is in one of the lockdown areas. It doesn't stop us working there, um, but we've got to make some changes. You know, it, it's all about social interaction and learning how to work with communities. But at the moment, it's it's avoiding that social interaction. So living outside that area and and coming in during the day and, and not integrating through the community that much. Uh, and and just um, and, and then Red Castle's out of the, the, the lockdown areas, so it's a, it's a little simpler. But uh, exploration is still continuing. Mining is an essential service and exploration is part of the mining business. Uh, we've had to use contractors from Victoria because Victoria is a pariah of Australia and, and locked down to, from the rest of Australia. But thank goodness, you know, we've got... Um, you know, a big population here and very good drillers and and um, and and geophysical crews and the like that uh, hasn't limited that. Okay, uh, I mean it's it's it, it's good and we're seeing it across the board. People be able to get work done and, and continue to move projects ahead, uh, even uh, adapting to what is uh, what is effectively going to be the uh, the new normal. I think for some time till we have a vaccine. Um, so, I think. Uh, and I, I, I have one last question, um, and that is, uh, you know, you have two sort of disparate sets of assets, Finland and Australia. Which one are you more excited about, Mike? <laughs> I'm a geologist. <laughs> I'm excited about discovering. So, um, you know, in, in, in many respects, um, you know, Finland's been a, a, a work in progress for a, a long time, and, and that does discovery. Not every... Geologist has the opportunity to make a multi-million ounce discovery, and that's the pathway. So, so that 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 excites me for that purpose. But uh, you know, I, I I became a geologist in Australia around these gold fields that we have here in Australia with a metal detector as a ten year old looking for nuggets, and, uh, and so that's been a that's been a lifetime desire of discovery, really, and and that's what that's what uh, turns my crank. So. So, uh, you know, being the first in 170 years to go under Redcastle is what immediately excites me at the moment, uh, for example, or, or doing the same thing at Sunday Creek. So that's because I'm an explorer and, uh, and, and, and the unknown excites me more than the known in many respects. But, uh, <laughs> I didn't, but uh, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a personal answer, but, uh, but I don't, don't want to write off Finland at all. That's a, that's a, that's a bloody exciting project and... And uh, like I said, uh, you don't you don't get your name badged on a discovery um, that's growing to be that size and where it will go very often, and that's a game changer for Finland. So no no discounting that, but the personal answer. Okay, all right. Um, I I think with that we'll uh, we'll, we'll wrap up the questions uh, wrap up the questions there. Um, I'd like to thank Mike for taking the time to uh, to go to talk to us about Mawson and, and about the Victorian goldfields and, and really give us a good overview of that, of that area uh, along with what uh, Mawson is up to there. Um, and then I also like to thank to everyone for joining us on the line. Uh, it's obviously uh, with, without a presenter or people to present to, it wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be much of a presentation. So thank you. Thank you for attending. Um, just a reminder for, we have a full slate of webinars this week and next uh, tomorrow we have at 2 PM Eastern. We have Tanzania and gold on Thursday at 2 PM Eastern. We have BlackRock gold. 
On Monday, you can see Jacob and I uh, give talk about our mid-year outlook uh, in a webinar on Monday, July 27th, and uh, check out our research page for a sneak preview of what you're going to hear about, Matt. Uh, and then lastly, on uh, on Tuesday, uh, we have our Summer Silver Conference uh, on the 28th. So um, if you're available to want to see a bunch of new silver companies present and what is a become a hot silver market, make sure you tune in there. And as always, visit our news and media page uh, for our upcoming events. So thanks again, Mike, and uh, thank you everyone for attending. Good afternoon.